Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tim Krause. Today is the 9th of May, 2020. This is going to be an update uh, about Golden Dawn. There have been some things that have occurred over the weekend which bear discussion. Now, I don't usually do study notes with these updates. I usually don't use study notes, but I'm going to use study notes this time. These things are important enough for you to be able to look at and for you to be able to study. Just as a reminder, anything, any study notes, anything that we use down in the description block, uh, we'll, you'll be able to get them off of my Google Drive. Um, I wanted to also let you know that we're using Isaiah, the methodology of Isaiah 28, chapter 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We also want to take a look at 2 Corinthians 13.1. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now I'm going to speak first of all to the assembly. And then I'm going to speak directly to the ministers and the staff members at Golden Dawn. To the assembly, this is really important. I have received reports, lots of reports, about what's happened over the last three or four days. Let me net it out for you. Someone took a stand against the church and the teaching of the church and sent me a copy of, uh, anonymously sent me a copy, audio copy of the service which took place on the 27th of April. Now, normally this wouldn't be a big deal. By the way, this is not illegal because Arizona is what's called a one-party consent state. Here's what that means. As long as I know that I'm taping you, then I can audio tape you. And I can present that audio tape as long as I'm aware that I'm audio taping it. I don't need your permission to audio tape you. Okay? I as long as I a party to the discussion. If you're speaking to me from across the pulpit, I am a party to the discussion. As long as I'm aware that I am taping it, then there's no illegality about it whatsoever because this is a single party consent state. Okay? Just, just to let you know, there's no illegality about it at all. And it shouldn't be even contentious. And let me tell you why I say that. It, every ministry outside that I'm aware of, outside of the message of William Branham, doesn't care if you audio tape and play it all over the internet. They're preaching the word of God. Now, it's interesting that inside of the message, there's a huge thing about, boy, we don't want people to know what we're teaching. Particularly in Golden Dawn, a very closed, a non-transparent, nobody gets to see what it is we're teaching or what it is we're telling people in our own assembly. And that's embarrassing. What's worse is, then the ministry went on a hunt for who it is that might have audio taped them. Boy, you talk about retribution. And you know, it's interesting. Isaac Noriega, during that 27th of April sermon, mentioned that young people don't come to Isaac Noriega. Well, Isaac and Ray, here's why. Because when you come, when you expose, as an example, your feelings to them, there is retribution. There is retaliation. We now have a situation where there's retaliation by Golden Dawn. They, they, boy, I'm telling you, they are looking to retaliate against whoever it was that provided that audio tape. Shame on them. And then they want to know why people don't feel comfortable coming to them. There's such a divisiveness in the church that there are people, people have been contacting people that don't have anything to do with the audio tape. Telling them that they're really upset if they're the guy who brought the audio tape. By golly, they man, oh man, woo! If they brought the audio tape, they just can't be friends with them anymore. There is such divisiveness in this church. 
It's you know, it's like you have to rat somebody out to the ministry in order to be acceptable to the ministry. And that's the love of God. That's what breeds love and fellowship and brothership within your assembly and within your congregation. We're going to talk about excommunication first of all. Now, if you had the internet assembly members, I know, I know, I know. You're not supposed to have the internet because it's an awful thing. Here's what drives me crazy when, minister, when, when message churches say, you can't have the internet because Brother Branham spoke about the evil spirits that will attach itself to you on the internet. Okay, It drives me nuts. We don't even think, as message ministers, you know, message ministers are telling you, we don't think you have self-control. We don't think you have God in you, the Holy Spirit in you enough to be able to discern for yourself what's right and what's wrong. Well, certainly they're not taught a lot of those life skills. They're not taught a lot of that critical thinking at Golden Dawn. I'll grant you that. If you had the internet, you would be able to go to a website, which was put together, by the way, and published by the Voice of God recording. These are William Branham's children. Okay? The table, it's called, table.branham.org. You'll see it here in the study notes. There's a link to it. I know you don't have internet access, okay? I, I suggest you look at this. Here's what you do. What here's what happens when you search for the word excommunicate. You 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 get you get responses. There, William Branham spoke ex, of excommunicate, and he used the term excommunicate. Okay, and excommunicate plural and excommunicated as in pre, a past tense. Okay. He uses those terms in his sermons 211 times, excommunicate, excommunicated, and excommunicates. Now, within those 211 mentions in the message, William Bransom used the term excommunicate, present tense, 68 times. Most of the examples Branham speaks about preachers who didn't preach according to the wishes of their deacon board or the elders of the church. Here are some examples of that, in case you can't go out to the internet and do this for yourself. This is where William Branham speaks in 1957. This is January the tw uh, 20th, evening service, God Keeps His Word, 1957. There you are, there you are. Oh, sure, we've got fine churches here, great big places, but many times, if the preacher preached over 20 minutes, the deacon board would excommunicate him. But bless your heart, a man of God won't listen to that nonsense. William Branham, I'm going to give you an, another example. This is, again, 1957, six, uh, June the 13th. This is a morning service. God keeps his word. Again, if you had the Internet, you could go out and do this for yourself. Okay? And our sermons are no more based upon the word. Usually in a modern pulpit, it's about who's the next president or some lovely roses somewhere or some program. Let the church out early so they can see a certain program. Preach over 20 minutes and they'll excommunicate you. Now, William Branham also sp spoke about Jarius and, and, you know, him being excommunicated if he went to go see, you know, Jesus about his family. And, you know, he spoke about those things. He spoke 68 times about excommunicate. Okay? Now, here's one example where William Branham uses the term excommunicate to speak about how the church is without, without love for one another. Listen to this. This is William Branham. If you tell me that you believe the message of William Branham, here's a sermon from William Branham right here, a sermon from William Branham. This is 1957. This is May the 19th in the morning. Hear ye him. How can you love? Look, the people, if I go overseas, I've got a little wife at home. I love her with all my heart. Now, here when I go overseas, I don't say, now, wait a minute, Mrs. Branham, sit down here. I'm going overseas. I'll be gone for six months. Thou shall not have any husbands but but me. Don't you dare have a date lest you go out with me. The, the Thou shalt not make my eyes at any man. Wouldn't that be awful? Wouldn't that be some kind of a home? Certainly. That's the law. And if I do, when I come back, girl, you're going to get it. Wouldn't that be a home? That's the way you got your church. That's the way your church is operating. Don't you go over there. If you do, I'll excommunicate you and strike your name off. 
People have been excommunicated and stricken from the rolls of Golden Dawn because they went to an assembly, another message assembly, outside of the building. Here William Branham speaks about exactly that. People have left the message of William Branham, and, and you know, I, I'm the first one to say there have been people who have learned no life skills, who have not had the opportunity inside of Golden Dawn to use any critical thinking, they're not giving any opportunity to think for themselves. And when they leave the message, because they are rebellious, they run into troubles. There's no question that there are those people. But you know, there's a lot, a lot of people that have not, they've not left God. They left the building in the, on the 27th of April. We had Isaac Noriega saying they didn't just leave the building. They left God. The revealed word of God, they left God. No, that's not true, Isaac. Shame on you. Here we have William Branham saying, that's the way your church is operating. Don't you go over there. Don't go to God in a different assembly. Don't go to another message assembly. We'll, we'll excommunicate you. We'll strike you off. Don't, don't you leave this building even though you love God and want and to, wanna, you know, you, your, next, uh, your next chapter in your Christian walk is to serve God in a different way than we do here at Golden Dawn. No, 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 no. Don't you do that. We'll bear false witness against you. We'll excommunicate you. We'll strike your name off. And here William Branham speaks about that exactly. And, and what was the first thing, that, in this quote, what was the first thing that William Branham said? How can you love? That's love? That's love for your fellow, for your assembly members? That's love for your family members? How can you love and tell people that? Now, what did William Branham say specifically about excommunicating people from an assembly? Sit down, folks. Hang on. This is William Branham. And if you believe in the message of William Branham, if you tell me that your message followers, these are quotes from William Branham. 1961, January the 12th, questions and answers. William Branham speaking. Therefore, I could not belong to any organization and feel justified by doing it. See, therefore, I do not take people in and make them members and so forth like that because I believe we are born to be members. We're born into the church of the living God. See, we don't take people's names off the book and excommunicate them and everything like that because I believe that's not in our our duties to do that. I'm going to back up and repeat that. This is William Branham speaking. We don't take people's names off the book and excommunicate them and everything like that because I believe that's not in our, our duties to do that. I believe it's God does the excommunicating. See? Here is William Branham, 1961, April the 24th. And... Here he is again speaking. This is the greatest news flash in history is the name of the sermon. And then if we go down to such and such a meeting, the pastor will turn us out. And if, uh, if the, oh, the bishop will do something to us or the church will excommunicate us. Oh, and we're so busy watching our members to see if they don't go to no other church or have anything else to do but just our little click. We're so busy with that. It's just like swapping members one with another, and it's just like taking one corpse from the morgue to another, just exactly. That's William Branham saying that. You excommunicate people because they choose to go to a different message assembly? You excommunicate people, they haven't left God, they choose to their next walk, their next chapter of their lives with their walk with Christ, and you excommunicate them and bear false witness about them over your pulpit? And that's okay with you? I'm speaking to the assembly now. That's okay with you? These are your family members. These are people who sat with you in your assembly for a long time. Here's William Branham now in 1962. This is July the 22nd. Show us the Father and it will suffice. And the pastors, how many more believing pastors that's here that's really believe the gospel? Full gospel pastors, may, may, you may be strangers. Would you like to come up and stand with we brethren? We don't excommunicate no one. We believe if you're a believer in Christ, is that right, my brother? Is that right, my brother? 
Many, many people have left Golden Dawn. They have not left God. They have been slandered. They have been defamed. They've been born false witness against. And they've been excommunicated from the assembly. Lee, didn't Jesus Christ himself talk about the wheat and the tares? We're going to go over some scripture here in just a minute, but I want you to keep that one in mind. What's the scripture that Golden Dawn does you to ex use to excommunicate members? Let's talk about that. Here's one of them. This is 1 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We're going to go back and look at that in context, but let's, that's one that they use. Here's another one. 1 Timothy, 1 chapter, 20th verse. Hymenius and Alexander are among them, and I have delivered them to Satan. Here's Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18. I assure you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Now, context is everything. And I want you to understand the context of the verses that I just read. Here is Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 5. Not just 5, 1 through 5. Here, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians about sexual immorality. Now listen to what he says here. It is widely reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is living with his father's wife, and if you are inflated with pride instead of filled with grief so that he who has committed this act might be removed from your congregation. For though I am absent in body but present in spirit, I have already decided about the one who has done this thing as though I were present, has done this thing, sexual immorality. A kind of sexual immorality that Paul talks about throughout his letters. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over for the destruction of the flesh. The one is the one who is living with his father's wife, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see, here's the problem from my perspective with people who aren't really ministers by training. They know how to parrot scriptures. They know how to put string scriptures together so that they don't make sense. They even know how to use proof texts from William Branham. The, ignoring other, other tech quotes from William Branham, they, they use proof texts from William Branham to justify their position to do something. They don't use the context. Maybe that's why every time Isaac Noriega throws somebody out of the church, he talks about how they're lustful and that they have sexual immorality. Could that be? Could that be the excuse? He would bear false witness about somebody to fit them into this category of sexual immorality so that he can justify in his own mind and in yours why he should excommunicate them from the assembly. For goodness sakes. Here's 1 Timothy. Hymenius and Alexander are among them, and I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. So let me finish that. This is the context. So that they may be taught not to blaspheme. So here we've got two reasons why Paul says somebody should be turned over to Satan. The first one is sexual immorality and the second one is blaspheming. By the way, guess what? The Lord says, Jesus himself said there was only one, only one unforgivable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And blaspheming the Holy Spirit's not disagreeing with the message, by the way. That's nonsense. Message ministers tell you that. That's totally untrue. Because, because blaspheming the Holy Spirit is turning your back completely on the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you choose to leave the building because you want to take the next chapter of your Christian life, because the Holy Spirit led you in that way, maybe to another message church, maybe to a different church altogether, you're not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. 
You're moving under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And here Paul tells us, I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Here we have Matthew chapter 16. This is Jesus Christ himself. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, I'm going to take a break here for just a moment. This is what a, mess, this is what a pastor does if you're in a church. A pastor brings the context to what he's reading. Okay? Here Jesus Christ has asked his disciples, who am I? Simon Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He has a revelation from heaven that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Simon Peter, you've received a revelation in heaven about who I am. Jesus here is talking about the revelation which Peter has received. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Now, if you look at verse 18, the Catholic Church says they take that completely incorrectly, in my opinion. They say, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, their understanding is, on Peter will I build my church. Therefore, that's why they say Peter's the first pope of the Catholic Church. But, but that's not what Jesus said in the verses just above that. Jesus said, you've received that revelation by the living God. On that rock, on the rock of revelation, I will build my church and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus goes on and he says, I will give you the king, king, keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. Now, there are some who read the King James Version, great version of the Bible, but it's an interpretive version. It is not a word-to-word -word version. The reason I like the Holman Christian Standard Bible is that it is the word for a, a, a fairly close word-for-word -word translation of the Bible. One of the words that the King James Version leads, leaves out in the context of the old scripture is already. If you want to know what the real context of the book is, I have a book called an interlinear Bible. It's a great book. It gives you the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and the original Greek of the New Testament, and it gives you a word-for-word -word translation. And do you know what's in that word-for-word -word translation of the original manuscripts in the original Greek here? The word already is in that original manuscript. Let me repeat it again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Now, what's the context there? What he, what's he telling Peter? Based on your revelation, Peter, you're going to come across things that you're going to want to bind on heaven. You need to understand that those things have already been bound on earth, in heaven. You can bind them on earth. They're already bound in heaven. If they're bad things, when you come across it and the revelation led by the Holy Spirit tells you these are bad things, they're already bad things in heaven. And if you come across things that are great things that you should, you know, praise and worship and, and you should be, they're already that way in heaven. Because the revelation of your Holy Father is going to give you those things. It's not about whatever I say has to happen here on in heaven. If I bind it on earth, has to happen in heaven. What if the guy binding it on earth is binding something that's anti-scriptural? What if he's binding something that is scriptural? Heaven is not obligated to bind something that you bind on earth if what you're doing is anti-scriptural. What it says here is, whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. The, the context is everything. But these are the scriptures used out of context 
that your ministry uses to excommunicate and to shun people. We can go a little bit further in Matthew. Here's Matthew 8, 18, 18. I assure you, whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. One word out of place, and the context falls apart. And, and by the way, your ministry isn't going to take you to a book that's a word-for-word -word translation. Go look at the interlinear Bible with the word for word translation that word already is in that is in the greek unbelievable how about the love of your families people from your families have been excommunicated and thrown out of the church where are you with that why aren't you outraged that members of your family have been treated that way by a ministry who uses things out of context to get rid of a dissenting voice in their assembly. How about, your how about your family members who have gone and who would love to have a relationship with you? They haven't left God. They've been thrown out of that building because they are a dissenting voice to your minister who uses this out of context. If your ministry uses these things out of context, can you imagine what else your ministry is using out of context? I can tell you, it's a complete host of other things. They don't even pay any attention to William Branham. They claim they are message ministers and they base everything on the message of William Branham. I just showed you where William Branham said, we do not excommunicate anybody. How is it that, that your message ministers can say they rely on William Branham for that action or for that behavior? They're not. Now, if you had the internet, you could go figure this stuff out for yourself. Let's talk about how the about the love of your families. Proverbs fam, chapter seventeen, verse seventeen: A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. People are going to go through difficult times. They're going to have faith that's going to fail. They're going to do all sorts of things. Do we lift them up and bring them back to God, or do we throw them out of the door? What do we do as family members? Do we bring our family members closer, or do we push them away? Here we have Proverbs, same, same Proverbs 17, chapter, or verse 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the elderly, and the pride of sons is their fathers. We should be so proud of our family members that we just want to bring them closer. Matthew 19, 19. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. To those members who went to people and said, Are you the guy that did that? Oh, how horrible you are. Love your, love your neighbors as yourself. Shame on you. And to, if, if, you, if you're encouraged by your ministry, and you are, if you're encouraged by your minister to, ministry to rat people out when they don't do something that the ministry tells you is the only way to behave, are you doing this? Are you loving your neighbor? Here we have Colossians 3, 12 through 15. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also forgive. Above all, Put on love the perfect hand of unity. This is Paul talking. Didn't William Branham say that he just taught what Paul taught? Here we have Paul saying, above all, put on love the perfect bond of unity. And yet, you throw people out the door and bear false witness against them? You allow somebody from your family to be destroyed like that? And let the peace of the Messiah, to which you were also called in one body, control your hearts. Be thankful. Here's Psalms again, 127, verses 3 through 4. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord. Children are reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born of one's youth. 
Here's Galatians. Here's Paul again. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Carry one another's burdens. Let me say that again. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Matthew 18 through 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among you. Listen. Whether somebody says, you know what, I'm going to leave this assembly. There's a lot of people that have been hurt as a result of this ministry. If people leave this assembly but have not left God or have not left Christ or the leading of the Holy Spirit, they still have Christ and the Holy Spirit. Gather with them in His name. There God will be among you. Why would you let someone harm your family members like this? You're to bring your family members closer. Lift them up. Hold people's burdens. Here we have the book of Hebrews. Chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not let us be concerned about one another in order to rat them out to the ministry so that the ministry can treat them poorly by bearing false witness. Let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from our worship meetings, as some habitually do. And in this case, they're forced to do it. They're told, don't bother to come back. You're not allowed to come back. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, be encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Encourage one another. Don't shun one another. Encourage one another. Bring them closer. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 8. Peter says, Now the end of all things is near. Therefore be serious and disciplined for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for one another, for each other. Since love co covers a multitude of sins. Above all, maintain an intense love for one another. Don't shun them. Bring them closer. Maintain an intense love for one another. Lift them up when their faith is weak. Hold them higher when their faith is weak. Just like when, when Moses was standing on the rock and when he held his hands up, the sea parted and people could come across. When, and he was there for hours. And when he got tired, people came alongside him and held his hands up because he was tired. So should we also come alongside those in our assemblies and in our family and hold them up when they get weary. Okay, last one I want to give you is uh, first chapter... Uh, or the first letter from John the Evangelist, chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not have his love his brother, he has seen, cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. Closer, not further away. Bring them closer. Do not shun them. Bring them closer. Now, I'm going to talk to the ministers, but I'm also going to talk to the me message assembly members here. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. This is the parable about the wheats and the tares. Let's talk about this for just a little bit. This is Jesus Christ speaking. This is Christ himself speaking. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. <clears throat> but while people were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat and left. When the plants sprouted and produced again, then the weeds also appeared. Okay, let's take a minute. 
Guy's got a wheat field. His enemy comes in and sprinkles seeds of weeds throughout. Okay? Vin vindictive, vicious thing to do to somebody who's trying to grow wheat. The landowner's slaves came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and gather them up? The slaves asked. No, he said. Now remember, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking. No, he said. When you gather up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. How many times, as an example, Isaac and Ray, have you thrown people out of your assembly and somebody takes a look at it and says, well, that was not the right thing to do. Here's the problem, guys. They're, they don't they fear coming to you or talking to you at all because of retribution and because of retaliation. If you don't believe that, then take a look at your actions in this particular instance when you're scurrying around the church, Ray, talking to people about who is it that had the audio. What matters? What does it matter who, who, who had the audio? Well, what does it matter? At the end of the day, if you had nothing to hide, it wouldn't have any matter at all. Here's why it mattered that somebody did the audio, Ray. This is why it matters. They demonstrated that you lied. They demonstrated it when you told me that Isaac Tim doesn't know who you are, has no idea who you are, doesn't watch your videos, has no clue, Tim. Well, why don't you believe me? Because, and he's never said those things, never talked about the snake and the quail, never, ever, ever, didn't ever say that, Tim. Well, well, the audio shows something entirely different, doesn't it, Ray? See, that's where it becomes an issue. Where it becomes an issue is that audio demonstrated that Ray Aguirre lied. And that Isaac did, in fact, speak about me in the context of the snake and the quail. That's why it matters. And that's why he's so angry. Because it made him look like a liar. Let's go on with the parable here. No, he said, when you gather up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but store the wheat in my barn. God is saying here, I'm the guy that reaps the harvest. It's not your responsibility to we reap the harvest. Let me tell you what I know from being ordained. This is a minister's responsibility. We sow seeds. That's what ministers do, Ray. We don't water. We don't reap the harvest. Watering and reaping the harvest, that's the Holy Spirit's job and that's God's job. God reaps that harvest. It's not up to you to reap the harvest. We sow seeds. And our seeds are good seeds, presumably, unless you preach things which aren't on the Word of God. Ray, Isaac, We sow seeds, the Holy Spirit waters, and God himself reaps the harvest. But but you guys are false teachers and liars. You threw them out. Uh, you, you excommunicated people because you said William Branham told us to excommunicate people. Guys, I just gave you lots of quotes from William Branham that said that's not what we do. We don't excommunicate anybody. We don't excommunicate anybody. How is it that you justify that? And if you're a message assembler listening to this, how do you justify having your ministries tell you that without telling you all of what William Branham said? See, when they tell you part truths and they don't give you the full context, that's an issue. Aren't you tired of only seeing a, a limited part of the Word of God? You're not living in the liberty of the Word of God because your ministers are false teachers and they are liars. And Ray, you were proven to be a liar by the audio tape that you're so, so viciously attempting to find the person that sent that to me. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3. If anyone considers him to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That's, that's the Apostle Paul telling us that. 
And when you take Christ out of context, when you take the words of God and don't give them in the fullness of the word of God, then you then you don't then you're nothing. You're not a minister. When you hide things from people like, you know, William Branham says we excommunicate people. Really? I don't want you to have the internet because then you'll be able to go out and discover yourself that that's not true. I had somebody when I was in the army going through a basic leadership course in the army. The guy and the guy was really a good teacher. He was a lieutenant and he said, "A leader who has no followers is just a guy walking around." Think about it, Ray. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 8 little bit further down don't be deceived God is not mocked for whatever a man sows he will also reap if you sow bad things in your assembly if you cast people out if you shun them if you give per people permission to disfellowship them are you gonna reap that at some point Ray and Isaac Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. You guys aren't. You guys are. You're not sowing eternal life to, from the from the spirit. You're not. You're you're bearing false witness against people. Let me give you an example. Somebody from your ministry or your staff said that I had been in jail for ten years, that I had committed sexual crimes, and that I kidnapped somebody from Golden Dawn. All of that is untrue. That is slanderous and it's defamatory. And we're going to find out who that was and we're going to hold them to account for that. That's bearing false witness. That's not sowing the Spirit. That's bearing false witness because you know that's not true. Here is Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's declaration. Let me repeat that. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's declaration. A false witness, Proverbs 19.9. A false witness will not go unpunished, and one who utters lies perishes. Ray. Proverbs 14.5, an honest witness does not deceive, but a dishonest witness utters lies. Here's Exodus, book of Exodus chapter 20, 16, line upon line, precept upon precept. We're going to go back and forward. We're going to look at Old Testament, New Testament. Here's the Old Testament, Exodus 20, 16. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Exodus 23 1 you must not spread a false report do not join the wicked to be a malice witness then we've got Timothy first Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 now the spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. Boy, I sure hope your consciences are seared. Ray, Isaac. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from food that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing should be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Now, I want to go back and talk about the context of this because this is really, really important. Here, Paul's writing to Timothy because people are saying, according to the law, don't eat this. This is not what you're supposed to eat. And people are taking the law forward into the new covenant of grace. They're taking the covenant of works into the covenant of grace. And what Paul is saying here is, look, everything is created by God. It's for good. There are people who are telling you that you should not eat certain things, that you should not behave a certain way, that you should not do certain things. You shouldn't dress a certain way. You should only dress like this. You should never cut your hair, women. Men, don't have a beard. That you're, we're talking about bringing the law forward into the new covenant. We're talking about bringing the covenant of works into the new covenant here. 
But because you're not a minister, you're not trained, Ray and Isaac, because you're not trained as a minister to understand the context of this particular verse, you don't understand that. You teach people to bring those covenants of works forward into the covenant of grace. Here, Paul is saying, hey, don't tell people to do stuff out of the covenant of works. Everything created by God is good. Nothing should be rejected if it, if it is received by th with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. And remember, if you think it's incorrect, God bless you. If you're convicted of the Holy Spirit that, that doing something is incorrect, then, then the Holy Spirit is working in your life to convict you. But that doesn't make you more holy or any less holy than the person that eats something that you would not eat or dresses in a way that you would not dress or cuts their hair, women, or doesn't shave their beard, Ray, and men. Goodness sakes alive. Listen, <clears throat> I want to tell you something. And now I'm speaking to the congregation, the assembly again. I want to tell you that you folks have been deceived for a long, long time. You have heard half. Now, I'm, I'm, I won't even say half. You have heard such a small amount of what God has in his word for you. All you've heard is condemnation for years. You've heard of condemnation and retribution. You've heard people basically bear false witness and shun people and throw them out of your assemblies. Are you tired of that yet? All under the guise that William Branham said you should do that. All under the guise that scripture says this is okay. In the context of the scripture, that's nonsense. And we just saw where William Branham said several times, we don't excommunicate anybody. Are you tired of that yet? Is this sinking in? No, you don't have internet access. The reason you're not supposed to have internet access is so that you can use your critical thinking and do the search. You would discover that what's being taught to you is false. I'm going to encourage you to go back to your scriptures. There's a lot of things that, that Isaac's not telling you, like problems with the IRS, like legal, in, like legal things that have taken place in the state of New Mexico on Isaac's behalf. There's a lot of things that Isaac's not telling you. Okay? You need to look at the Word of God, and you need to figure out for yourselves, are you tired of being deceived? If you're tired of being deceived, do something about it. And for goodness sakes, quit being div divisive amongst yourself, please. All right. I'm done with this update. If anybody at Golden Dawn sees this, I'll, you know, I'm sure that I'm going to not be the favorite at Golden Dawn yet again. It's okay with me. I've got big shoulders. And I want to let everybody know that we're not taking action against Golden Dawn for emotional support, Ray. We're taking action against Golden Dawn for defamation of character and for slander. It's important to us because we rely pretty heavily on, our, uh, on the ability to have a clean record so that, we can, so that we can do what we do or live where we want to live in order to be able to do that. And you are placing that in jeopardy, Ray. So we're not, it's not emotional support. I'm a big boy. It has to do with slander and defamation of character. All right. God bless everybody in the Assembly of Golden Dawn. It's time for you to start to examine yourselves and start to get together and figure out whether or not you want to live under these conditions. This is not the fullness of the liberty of Jesus Christ. It's not even the fullness of the liberty of God's word. It's not even the fullness and liberty of the message of William Branham. God bless you. I hope everybody's okay. We will get to a regularly scheduled, but this came up so important. There was so much going on at Golden Dawn's church this weekend. It was really important for me to address this. God bless everybody. We look forward to talking to you again now. Bye-bye.